Hello again and welcome to another edition of Live Since You Asked, the quarantine editions. I'm Chad Konecki, one of your hosts, and I am joined today by a very special crew, three of the five living Olympians, uh, that is, those who have attended the Olympic Games as an athlete and also graduated from St. John's Prep. So this is a pretty, pretty good one. I'm not going to take too much time with questions of my own because I know there's, the audience is going to have a lot. Uh, plus, it's three guys. I got to talk to the booking agent because, like, we could do an hour on each of these guys. And I got to, why didn't we just invite Jimmy Pedro? That would have been great. Then we would have asked you one question each. Um, okay, so uh, quick introduction, quick brief introduction for these guys. Uh, let's see. First, we have Ray Carey, class of 1991. He was at the uh, 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta. Uh, he's a graduate of Stanford University where he was NCAA champion in the 1993 200-yard butterfly. Two hours, yards or meters, Ray? Uh, in college, we swim yards. Uh, yeah, meters, meters in the summer, yeah. That's what I thought. Uh, all right, I'm continuing with your intro now. Uh, the team won three NCAA championships when you were there. So that's three pretty, pretty big pieces of hardware that you have on your hand uh, on occasion. And you're currently the CEO of Archive Social, which I actually, these are my own words, it ensures clients meet public records and social media archiving regulations by automating those communications uh, preservation in context. We'll get more into that later. We also have Steve Langton, class 2001, a two-time Olympic silver medalist, why don't I just stop there? But he also uh, in attended three consecutive Olympic Games. Uh, he's in commercial real estate in Manhattan. And he's also a trustee associate at St. John's Prep and on the board of directors for USA Bobsled and Skeleton, which is a crazy sport. It's even crazier than your sport, Langton. Uh, and then last but not least, so we, as you can see, we went age and beauty and then just youth and beauty. Uh, John McCarthy, class of 2004, 11-year uh, career in pro hockey. Uh, he captained the Barracuda for the past four years, and he's the franchise leader in games played, goals, assists, and points. Uh, an ischemic stroke in December uh, due to a hole in his heart forced him to retire, uh, and 17 days later, the Barracuda hired him as, a, as an assistant coach. So that kind of shows you what they think of him. In May, he was uh, announced as the Hunt Memorial Award winner which is pretty much the highest award that you can win in the AHL. So that's who we got. Let's get into it. I have a question for all three of you, um, and we can answer them in order of graduation year. Uh, most memorable Olympic moment. I hear a lot of opening ceremonies when I interview Olympians, uh, and that's fair game. But anything goes as far as most memorable Olympic moment. And I should add that all of you attended the Olympic Games and competed while another prep grad was there, which is pretty cool. So go right ahead. So early, uh, so uh, the the oldest fella first, or yeah. the youngest fella first, the oldest fella first. I would say this wasn't a particular moment, but it really just was a feeling I had throughout. Uh, I was really fortunate enough to to compete, you know, quite a bit internationally, even when I was in, uh, you know, in high school at St. John's. Um, but it wasn't until I was at the Olympics that I had this uh, sort of sense of national pride and uh, sort of a connectedness that people I didn't even know were rooting for me. Uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, swimming is uh, not not a fan sport like, you know, like hockey and others. And so uh, just like kind of putting on a, a uniform that said USA, knowing that just, you know, someone you didn't know on Main Street in some country, in some town across the country, was sort of rooting for you in your corner, um, you know, just gave me that that sort of uh, sense of patriot pride that I really hadn't had before. So that's probably for me the most memorable part uh, or sort of the feeling that I took away that was just different than anything else I've done. I love that. Well, Langton. So for me, bobsled isn't necessarily a fan sport either except for you know the two weeks every four years that the olympics are on tv and people are crouched in front of those television sets for me you know every olympics was a little bit different the moment that really sticks out is 
crossing the finish line in the two-man race in Sochi when I knew that I had won my first medal. And at that point, it didn't really matter what color it was. That was kind of the justification to me that all the time, the effort, the blood, the sweat, the tears, the sacrifice, time away from family, it was worth it. You know, and that moment is, if I close my eyes and think back to my Olympic experience, it's that moment that sticks out even more so than, you know, opening ceremonies or actually getting the medal around my neck. Wow. That's a great memory. How about you, McCarthy, the most recent Olympian along Langton? Well, in fairness, Chad, I was going to say opening ceremonies because that was really cool, but I'll go a little deeper. And this may sound weird, but it was picture day because exactly like Ray said, that was the first time I had ever put on a USA jersey. Um, a lot of the other kids on the team, I shouldn't say kids, guys on the team, um, you know, there, there are teams growing up you know, that you play for USA and I had never got the, I never made any of those teams. So right. I never had the opportunity to put that Jersey on. So putting it on for the first time was picture day. And so, you know, putting it on and, and looking in the mirror and saying, wow, this is really, really reality was, was kind of a, a big moment for me. Yeah. That's an outstanding memory. Uh, I, I don't know why I hear opening ceremony so much. I, the, my favorite opening ceremony story is I was covering uh, the 92 games and it was the women's crew team that won a silver medal. And uh, one of the athletes was standing at opening ceremonies with somebody who didn't speak English from an Eastern European country, but they knew the Lynn, Lynn, Lynn city of sin song. <laughs> so yeah, I will tell you in the, uh, uh, you know, all of us took the easy way out. There was a, a fun Olympic moment I had, which was uh, I got to meet Shaq, who was on the dream team. And uh, he is every bit as big in person as you see on TV. He had on a full purple suit, including a purple bowler hat. And Motorola had just come out with the smallest cell phone. So if you guys are seeing the movie <laughs> Zoolander, it looked like he was holding a postage stamp, you know, talking into it. So. I had my uh, my moment with Shaq is also uh, the Olympic Games oh, game. I great. can't believe you didn't leave it that. That's hilarious. Was that the first dream team, I think? Or maybe the second? I think it was the first dream team. Yeah. Yeah. So. Wow. Um, quick follow-up for Langton. Um, having been to three games, you know, was there a takeaway you have? It was the biggest evolution uh, in the games across those years or the biggest evolution in, in Olympic or sports culture or the biggest difference amongst the three venues, you know, amongst the three Olympiads? Yeah, it's a great question. So for me, you know, 10 years is a long time in the life of an athlete and the Olympics, you know, you live your life in, in four year chunks and quads. So every Olympics that I went to, I was a different person. There were different goals. Vancouver, it was as close to a home games as I was ever going to get. My goal was to make the team. And, you know, as an, an athlete, as a high achiever, it, it's funny how the goalpost always moves. So four years later at Sochi, you know, we had a lot of success leading in and I, I knew all the pieces were in play for us to do well. So heading into those games, I had the horse blinders on, it was to win a medal. And then fast forward four years, I'm 34 years old, which is ancient in bobsled years. Um, and, and my goal was not only to make the team, but to, it was my opportunity to give back. You know, I had passed my peak and there were so many younger athletes that this was their first games and maybe didn't have the type of leadership that I had growing up as an athlete or coming up through the sport. So that was my opportunity to really give back and invest in a sport that gave me a lot. Yeah, great answer. Ray, I was going to ask you, um, did you have a chance to interact with Jimmy Pedro when you were down there in Atlanta? I think that was his third games or second game. Yeah, no, uh, I didn't see him while, while I was there. I think, uh, uh, as, as these guys know, uh, you know, sometimes you get pretty uh, sequestered. Uh, I was fortunate enough that uh, swimming is on the front end. Uh, so I actually didn't go to the opening ceremonies because you're all, you know, resting your legs and getting ready. and You know, everybody doing your, uh, uh, you know, sort of preparation. Um, and then, uh, you know, you're done halfway through. So the back half was really where I got to go out and uh, uh, see a lot of folks. But no, I didn't I didn't get a chance to run into Jimmy. Well, so I think five days after you swam, I looked it up and not to not to put it a, too much of a down point on the interview. But that was when the, the bomb went off. Um, were you there for that? And what, you, what are your recollections? Uh, I was. So uh, swimming was over. I had done my event. And uh, this is how old I am. They gave us all Motorola pagers. So we all had pagers and everyone wanted to go out and I was, uh, 
you know, out enjoying the Olympics with the New Zealand swim team. I had some buddies that, uh, you know, it's fun in college, you get to swim with, uh, you know, these, these folks from all over the country. So they're your teammates, you know, during the winter. And then, you know, they're your competitors in different countries in the summer. And, uh, and so we all got this text that, hey, there's been this, this bombing, everybody needs to come back. And I was young at the time, so it probably wasn't a good choice. I thought, everyone loves New Zealand. I should just stick with these folks because you know, who would wanna, you know who would want to harm anybody in New Zealand? So I spent the night with the New Zealand uh, New Zealand swim team and uh, you know had a little talking to around not not getting back to uh, my dorm uh, uh, that night when the text went out for everybody. Oh my goodness, that's classic. Um, another a question for John. Um, we actually um, had Colin Blackwell who plays for the Preds on a couple of weeks ago and he was saying super nice things about you uh, in terms of your leadership, you guys played together. Um, I'm curious, you, you know, you played, 34 is ancient for uh, for ice hockey too, man. And you played in the Olympic games uh, at 33. What do you think, was there a key for you being able to sort of in, endure 11 years of professional hockey? Like, could you point to any one thing yeah, it's it's actually kind of funny. It's it's a little bit different how minor league. I the pri I primarily played in the minor leagues, and how it works there is youth is at a premium. That it's a developmental league for the NHL, so they they want as many young kids in the league as possible. But at the same time, they need a couple of older guys to kind of show the younger guys the ropes, show them how to treat it as a profession, and and come to work every day and treated appropriately so I, I was able to to find that role for myself and honestly that that prolongs my hockey career for multiple years the the Sharks organization um, I was with them for parts of every year that I played um, they they were great to me and and they gave me an opportunity to to fulfill that role and then for guys like Colin you know it's it's um it's satisfying to see him having success at the NHL level because you know I I feel like he was a rookie when when I was the captain and, you know, just kind of taking the extra time and and maybe pulling him aside at a certain point or showing him a thing or two. And, you know, to see that he took it and, and he has success with it, you know, that's a good feeling for me. And, you know, it's uh, as my career went on, it, it went from, you know, me scoring goals, me getting assists, me getting points to, you know, watching those younger guys have success themselves. And, you know, there's a there's a satisfaction that comes with that as well. Uh I, I wanted to ask all three of you guys another question um, before I start to get over to the audience questions because they're piling up on me here. Um, is there an insight uh, that an SJP coach left any of you with or all of you with, you know, an aphorism, an approach, a mantra that you carried with you throughout your athletic career or at least thought back on from time to time? Uh, let's go in order of graduation again. All right. Well, um, I hope this isn't going to sound too sappy, but, uh, you know, I grew up every day with uh, with a great St. John's prep uh, coach, my dad. Um, and uh, and so, uh, you know, he was a coach at home and he wasn't a swim coach, but we spent a lot of time sort of comparing uh, uh, training and times and track and field and swimming. And there's actually sort of a, a, a corollary, an algorithm between the two. Um, I will tell you, uh, I have to fit it into this interview in some way is because uh, uh, we kid my dad about Steve a lot. And Steve may not know this, but, you know, Steve is the only uh, the track and field uh, athlete at St. John's to be in the Olympics. So we would tell my dad, you finally got an Olympian, but like in the wrong sport. Okay. So, uh, uh, so <laughs> he got a lot of grief from us. But uh, there's a lot. Uh, you know, I didn't swim specifically for St. John's. I was in a club program, but specifically to St. John's, there's a lot of the lessons that he passed on to hundreds of, uh, you know, boys a year that uh, he came home and I just heard him talking about uh, performance and times and goal setting since I was, you know, really, really young. And that carried me through the prep and then, you know, on to swimming later. Great answer. You might talk about the same guy, right, Langton? Uh, you got me. <laughs> Um, yeah, at St. John's, I, I was a track athlete, indoor and outdoor, for four years. And, you know, over the course of my years of the prep, Ray was, you know, an incredible coach to me. And then as I moved on to Northeastern, he turned into a mentor, someone I would discuss, 
you know, my, my current career, my collegiate career with, and then going on to the Olympics, other than my parents, I, I don't know if there was anyone that was prouder and he was one of the biggest fans that I had. And now in my adult life, we still have conversations, some of which surround high school track, but he's become a wonderful friend. And, you know, I, I look back and I think of, you know, Ray and my parents. And the one thing that I was kind of left with was, you know, the only thing that stands between you and what you want to accomplish is what you're not willing to do. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of took that to heart and focused on exactly where I wanted to get to and gave it everything I had. Wow. I got to remember that one. I, he was a pretty good coach for you because I, if I'm not mistaken, I think you still own the record. You know, the only prep guy to win a hundred in state championships or something like that. That may be true. I have a couple of brothers too, obviously the same last name. So um, I think I get credit for some of their successes <laughs> too, <laughs> which I'm okay with. <laughs> Went to high school for nine years. <laughs> um, how about you, McCarthy? Uh, yeah, both my coaches at St. John's, that would be Coach O'Leary for football and uh, Coach Marinelli for hockey. They both know like specific lessons stick out to me, but I would say Coach O'Leary taught me how to how to compete every day. Football is a different sport than hockey. It can be grueling at times. The practices are a lot longer. Um, so he showed me how to bring it every day and, and compete every day. And Coach Marinelli, you know, the hockey team at St. John's, we were a tight knit group. And, uh, you know, I think the biggest lesson I learned from from hockey, not just from Coach Marinelli, but the other guys that I played with was how to form a team and how to play for each other and battle for each other every night. Yeah, that's good advice. You, I think you were, correct me if I'm wrong, two-time all-conference in both sports. Is that right? I know football. I'm not sure. Possibly. I, I That was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. You're ancient. Yeah. Uh, let's go to some audience, question, audience questions, but I do have a couple more if we get to them. Um, let's see. Wow, this looks like it's for all all three of you, uh, how how did you do it? Where is the motivation come from? Uh, is it the fame and the riches? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure how to answer that question, but they're asking about pride and motivation and, and how critical that is. And I think Steve touched on it. You know, uh, the only thing standing in the way is what you're not willing to do. But uh, what was it in your core when you'd have to go and, you know, get up at six or five or earlier and do it again and again. Uh, That's right. yeah. That's a, lot of, a, a lot of times people say, you must really love the water and have a feel for the water and love swimming. And uh, uh, and I was like, uh, I don't know, I hated it. I hated waking up early. I hate, it hurt. Every time I jumped in, it was cold. We swam hard, it hurt. I just, I just hated losing and I liked winning. And so th that's what I had to do <laughs> to win more and lose less. So it wasn't this uh, uh, like special connection to the water or man, I just love going back and forth in the lane. Uh, it just was tying together. It was really for me. If I put more in here, I'm just going to get more out there. And uh, as I've gotten older and become, you know, a business person and a, and a, uh, and a parent, um, you know, sometimes I, I, I look wistfully back at the days where I was like, if I put in a hundred more laps, that's going to equal half a second. You know, just the, just how simple it was to have that equation that if I work, I get, and that connect that, that equation, uh, really in many ways is what drove me. So, so you're saying parenting is more nuanced? A little, well, at least in my house. <laughs> I'm not sure. The, the harder I try, I think the, the worse it gets. I don't know. <laughs> How about you, Steve? You know, it, it, it's, it's pretty funny. I think, I think Ray hit it right on the head. Um, most people probably don't know this either. Bobsled is the competing portion and, you know, competing with your teammates and representing Team USA. That part's wonderful. It, it's always cold. It's horribly uncomfortable. And, you know, the training really takes its toll on you. I wish I was faster and I could have gone to the Olympics in track and field. Um, but those are kind of the cards I was dealt. And I found this, you know, rather obscure sport that I happen to be very good at. And for me, it was, you know, going to the Olympics and being an Olympian representing Team USA was the first dream I can ever remember having as a kid. And for me, it was a math equation, too. If I work very hard at this, you know, I clearly have an aptitude. But if I put in the time and the effort, 
then I will get to where I want to be. And that's, you know, representing the United States and having five rings on my chest. Yeah, absolutely. How about you, John? For me, uh, motivation wise, you know, it's always been hockey's a, a team sport. And I alluded to it um, when I talked about hockey at the prep. That's where I first learned it. It's I always wanted to play for the guy next to me. You know, it's uh, it's a unique a hockey locker room is a unique spot. It's you can fake a lot of things in life, but your teammates, you know, once they look you in the eye and they see you on the ice, you know, they, they kind of see right through you if you're fake. So, you know, for me, it was always I always had a fear of letting my teammates down, letting my buddies down. I, I wanted them to know I was always there for them. I was going to compete with them. And so at every level I played at, that's what I focused on. And I think at times, especially for youth players, if, if you get looking too far ahead down the road, that's where you're going to suffer some setbacks. I think if you concentrate on the situation that you're in and playing for your teammates and succeeding as a team, you know, things good things tend to happen for you. Excellent answer. I wanted to ask, this is for all of you, but I have to start splitting them up amongst you. The, um, I wanted to ask Ray, because you mentioned, you know, 100 laps equaled half a second, um, and the world is a little more complicated than that. Um, somebody's asking what lessons do you take from your training and your competition that actually do um, relate to your current role? Uh, I think uh, uh, there's a lot. I will tell you, I, um, uh, I had a great coach, this coach Joe Brunel, and we would just break problems down. And so uh, that is very translatable from swimming. I remember, you know, there was this, uh, a uh, goal I was trying to make, which was to break two minutes for the first time in the 200 butterfly. And it, it could be anything. And he said, could you do it? And I said, I don't think I could do that. And he says, well, can you do a uh, 50 meter? Can you do a lap in 30 seconds? Well, I, I could do that. Could you do two? Well, I don't know if I can do two. Well, can you do two if I give you a break? Well, yeah. And so you just break it down and put it back together. And uh, so, you know, lots and lots of things in life look really hard from far. Uh, and if you can break them down into their pieces and you know what he said you know eat an elephant just one bite at a time uh and so uh really from sport just taking something hard setting a goal breaking it down to its pieces finding a way to put it back together i found is super useful in business um because there's not much that you can't do in little increments over a large period of time and then now in a work setting for me you know with now multiple people so really that that's probably translate and i find myself using that that, you know, I look at something and I'm like, oh, this is the two minute, two, 200 butterfly. I got it. I got this. Did, did you ever swim sub two? I did. I did. So. Wow. So that, you know, that would have put it closer to the finals in 96, by the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, my race, my race wasn't as strong at the Olympics as I wanted to be. And Chad, thank you so much for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you were like three seconds away from gold. That's not, it's pretty impressive. <laughs> um, hey, this one for Steve. Um, how did you keep your Olympic dreams alive for so long? I dream of representing the uh, men's national team at the World Cup. I think he means soccer, but. No, it's fantastic. Um, you know, as mentioned, going to the games, it was, it was a pretty lofty goal as a five-year-old or six-year-old, but that was my dream. And, you know, for whatever reason, it stuck with me, even through you know, my failures, I I ran track and field at a certain level, but I wasn't good enough to make the Olympic Games. Um, so, I, you know, I consider that in a lot of ways it was a success, but in other ways it was a failure. Um, even prior to that, a little known fact, I didn't make the freshman basketball team at St. John's. Um, not that I was going to the games in basketball, but it, it was one of those things. The Olympic dream, for whatever reason, you know, whether it be I was a competitor or I saw that at the highest level of athletic achievement, I saw it always as somewhere that I wanted to get to. And, you know, I was open. I wasn't actively searching out bobsled, but I was open to avenues to get there. And, you know, I, I think it has to do with being ready, you know, when an opportunity presents itself, um, you know, especially if it potentially leads to exactly where you want to be. Wow, that's great advice for, especially for the kids. And I love that, you know, multiple world championships, two Olympic medals, and you still remember that you got cut from the freshman basketball team. You guys are such competitors. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, question for John. John, uh, this struck me the other day. We talked a couple weeks ago, as as you may remember, and um, you, were, you were a pro hockey player for 11 years. You've been a coach for 168 days. What, what, like how, what are you focusing on right now? 
Yeah, right now I'm just focused on getting better. There's uh, actually right before this, there's a coaching conference going on right now virtually. And so it's just kind of NHL coaches, some national team coaches, um, and they're just sharing their insights and kind of how they started and what they do to their teams to build a winner. And this morning, an interesting one was the Toronto Raptors. Um, and he, he was sharing his, his story about, you know, how they kind of built the team and how he defines leadership. And so right now for me, it's just about gathering as much insight as I can, um, kind of sorting it out and using kind of what I think can apply to me and what, what can't. And then, you know, and then when, whenever we start back up, you know, applying that in the right ways, I think is going to be the, the most important part. Yeah. It's going to be a big year for you. It, whenever this gets going again, I have yeah. a, uh, Oh, here's a good question um, for all of you. Absent special circumstances and assuming that the life flow of life allows for it, would any of you ever consider coaching at the prep someday? Oh, so I, all right, I'm, I wasn't sure if I'm supposed to always go first. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty entrenched down here in North Carolina. So um, I would like to coach. Uh, I have, uh, uh, you know, always been uh, busy at work. I flowed right into the sort of you know the, the the corporate world and so it's kept me pretty busy and the family's pretty busy but uh um you know my kids are getting older and i see the the end of that soon and uh so no i've always been attracted to the the idea of uh, uh the idea of coaching um but uh you know uh my wife's from west georgia uh you know we moved down here we're in north carolina so um it's just not so cold uh in in the winter and uh, <laughs> so I'm not sure if we're headed back that way. I hear you. How about you, Langton? So I guess it was 2010. No, it was probably before that. I actually did a little coaching at the prep um, in one of my off seasons for a couple months. I, I helped out Ray um, when my brother Chris was actually a senior. Um, the timing was perfect. And, um, you know, I loved every minute of it. I'm at a point in my career right now where doesn't really make sense, but eventually, you know, coaching and helping young athletes get better is definitely a passion of mine. Um, and if we get to that point where logistically it makes sense and, um, you know, given where I am in my career, it makes sense. It's something I would definitely be open to. McCarthy, I mean, can you do, can you do both? Can you coach the pros and high school? I don't know if the teams are close, maybe I would, I would love to. I mean, I, I think, you know, as, as you guys both touched on, you know, it's, it's fun to work with good people and the, and the prep is surrounded with good people. And when you're working with good kids that want to learn and want to get better, I think that's the key to, to coaching is, is that's really what you want to work with. And, and there's so much of that at St. John's that, you know, it would be, a, it would be a really good time. So maybe, maybe somewhere down the line, you know, that would be an option. I just want to touch on, you know, I asked you, John, about your work. I wanted to touch on the work of these other two guys. You know, it's not all about the uh, you know student athlete. There's a student part. Um, and, you know, I wanted to ask Ray, based on my understanding of, of what you're doing now and what you've done in the past with your career, I mean, uh, it seems like it must be very much in demand what your company does. Um, especially with the power of social media to, you know, really uh, evaporate trust in an agency or destroy a brand in, overnight in, oh, in minutes. Can you talk a yeah, little bit about say, uh, yeah, it? Yeah, it's a fun company that I'm a part of is, uh, uh, I don't know how much, uh, if people tuned in for old Olympians, I'm not sure uh, how interesting it's going to be, but uh, I find it interesting in that you know, we live in, you know, in the U.S. in a free and open society. And one of the things that we take for granted that that happens here is our public officials are on the permanent record. If you agree with them or don't agree with them, we stand up to be a transparent society that what we say is available. Um, and uh, really what we say is increasingly on social media. So a lot of uh, communication has moved to social media. But we have this issue that Social media was built for private citizens. Social media can be manipulated and changed. It can be deleted. And so there's a gap there. So public institutions want to use it. They want to talk to people where they live on Facebook and Twitter or what have you. And so we built some software to, to solve that problem. So, uh, you know, we do it for, you know, the White House and, you know, the biggest cities, uh, you know, in the countries down to small rural folks. And so uh, it's fun to, uh, 
you know, uh, run a growing company with a bunch of young folks. In some ways, I guess I'm a little bit of coach in that age. I got, you know, 80, 26 year old average age of the sales force is 26. And I got 80 of them working at home, trying to make sure that they keep, you know, keep going uh, in, in, in totally, you know, total work from home. Uh, many of them, it's their first professional job uh, out of college. So that part's fun, but it's also fun to, we have a tiny little part in this, uh, trying to sort out the wild west of social media and say, what can you trust? What can you not trust? What's a verified post from a, you know, from an elected official or, or a public institution. So. You have a clients in education too, right? We do. So uh, mostly K through 12 schools um, uh, in general. And the same thing is that, uh, you know, it's important that when a, when a school goes out and puts out a, a notice or report or what have you, that uh, they stand up to the permanent record and, uh, we all make mistakes. Uh, 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 users come in and post things that they should and shouldn't do, and you know those things should be held up in the in in the light of day, and we should determine what you know what's right and what's wrong. So we kind of create that permanent record, if you will, on uh, social media, that, that archive, if you will. I um I can't remember us making a mistake here as a communications department. However, maybe you should send uh, Headmaster Hardeman a sales packet of some kind. We could. I could get a uh, 26 year old sales development rep on the phone with him right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to ask Langton, and we're going a little over, but it's the Olympians. Um, the, uh, you know, sales, real estate sales in, in uh, the Big Apple, do you think he could have picked a higher pressure sales environment? <laughs> uh, you know, for better or for worse, I'm attracted to that type of thing. And I always have been. And, you know, being this is a call with with three Olympians, I, I think a lot of the soft skills you learn on the playing field or in the pool or on the ice rink, uh, whether it be hard work, teamwork, resiliency, um, the ability to manage time effectively, those all transfer to my professional life. And I'm sure many ex-athletes feel the same way. The real estate piece, I grew up with a father who was a real estate developer in uh, the North Shore. So I always knew real estate was on my horizon. I didn't know just exactly what. And when brokerage came along, uh, it just made sense given what I had done, you know, the skills I had picked up on the athletic field on, on, on the bobsled track. And, um, you know, I'm fortunate that I ended up in a really great situation. I have a, I have a viewer question that uh, I think it might be good to close on if all three of you could answer it. Um, weird times, right? Um, what advice, would you give to a prep senior who is about to go to college in theory on campus but potentially remotely but what, what general counsel would you offer a young person at that stage in their life in these uncertain times ray wow that's a heavy question yeah. um, in, in a major way um, and it has me thinking about, uh, you know, this is this is my uh, quarantine beard. I hadn't had one before. I had it once before and it came in a lot grayer than it did the, the last time. So uh, uh, you got me sort of a little reflective. I would tell you, like, you know, right now with what's going on, the older I get, the less I know. And, you know, that's a truism that a lot of, you know, uh, uh, that I wish I listened to more <laughs> from old guys when I was sort of coming up. And uh the world is a really complicated space and it got only more complicated in 2020 um, with everything that's going on with race relations, everything that's going on uh, with COVID. It is a wacky, wacky time. And the one thing that I know is that uh, you get older, you get perspective, the opinions that you have when you're 18, uh, if you can keep yourself open to revisit your opinions, open to continue to learn, uh, whether it's as an athlete, whether it's as a a business person, whether it's as just a human being, um, those people that are open to learn, uh, you know, do incredible things. And those people are wildly attractive because they don't have all the answers, um, but they have a big kind ear. So I think that's what this environment needs right now is, you know, more listeners. I love that. L Langton, that's hard to match. It is tough to match, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I agree with so much of what, what Ray said. Um, you know, the best advice I can give is that life is not linear. It's not a straight line. It actually plays out more like a bobsled track. Um, and you have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to, you know, roll with the punches. But while doing so, you know, set goals, keep those goals in your sights. Um, 
obviously respect everyone and keep your loved ones close. And, you know, if you really want to do something, don't take no for an answer and, you know, don't stop until you get there. Well, that's pretty good. Man, McCarthy, the young guy has to go last. It's tough. Real tough. Real tough to match those. But I, what I would what I would urge them to do is control what they can control. What's going on right now is kind of out of their control. You know, whether or not they can be on campus next fall, they – ultimately you know that's not really up to them i would say focus on what's in front of in front of you you know if, if it's going to be remote learning take advantage of it do the best you can get your gpa as high as you can through that you know and then when you come when you come to campus it'll it'll be you know a little bit easier of an adjustment so my biggest thing would be control you know what what you can control and the rest that's out of your control you know don't don't stress out about it because at the end of the day there's not really a whole lot you can do about it Man, I wish I was the kid asking that question, because if somebody had told me, uh, be a better listener and roll with the punches and worry about what you control, I would be an Olympian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys are so great to talk to. Just, you know, even if you don't mean it, say you might come on again in a, in a next season. <laughs> Anytime. I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to. My parents are still connected to the school. I don't have a choice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. Wow. See, some things never change. Um, well, guys, I can't thank you enough for your time, your insights, um, and your, your heartfelt honesty. So I think it really was great for, ki for kids in our community to, to see. And we had a lot, of, uh, a lot of people on. I didn't even get to half the questions, but you have to come back. Happy to. You yeah. know where to Thanks. find us. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a ton, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Chad.